We just want to see your glory. To captivate, to understand just even a fraction of your glory. We want all of you, God. Father, I pray you just empty this vessel, God. You take everything that's in me. I am absolutely nothing but a shell. And God, I pray that you fill this vessel with the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that your spirit pours so mightily and so deep and so penetrating into every heart in this room, God, that they know when they walk out of this place, they were with you. They saw you. That they trust you. That they honor you and they glorify you. And they can't stop talking about you. God, this is, this is about you. So I pray you take all the fleshliness, all of the, <laughs> the carnality, all the things that make up this, these, this human shell, and you take it out so we can experience all of who you are and all that you want to do in us. Lord, I pray against any strongholds right now in the character, in the name of Jesus, I pray you take out fear. You take out hesitancy. You take out anything, God, that is hindering your glory from being known and the worship of your daughters from being full out, recklessly abandoned. The kind of faith that says, I will not budge. Lord, we honor you. We honor you with our lips, Lord, with through this worship. We honor you, God. I pray that every woman here can join me in saying, I honor you, God, with my heart. I'm offering myself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. This is our spiritual act of worship. Lord, we love you. Do your work this morning. Speak your truth this morning and change our lives this morning. In Jesus' name. We can just go home now. <laughs> okay, so as you guys get settled, feel free, grab snacks, bathrooms, coffee, you know how the whole routine is. Don't, um, don't worry about being distracting. Just go ahead and do it. Doesn't distract. Um, this weekend, we have discussed how fiery trials produce what? Produce what? Steadfast faith. What's the caveat here? If we let it, right? Every time there's an opportunity to go, man, I'm going through, a, we're all going to face the fiery trials. How, how you handle that, what you do in that time, determine your steadfast faith. Determine what the outcome of that's going to look like. So how to have steadfast faith. We talked about that on Saturday, right? First thing we did, the first session, we went through stones of remembrance, making sure our minds are set on the faithfulness of God to go back and remember what he's done. Go back and remember who he is so we can see his faithfulness. Go back and cling to the very thing that we remember about him that we can go, you know what, the next fire, I'm ready. I'm ready. I know where to go. This, and then we, we had Becky share her testimony and walking through 50 years of, of walking with the Lord. You know, she shared so much of her life with us. And we were able to see, man, what do you do through life experiences, through those fires? How do you cling to our God during those fiery trials, right? We went through, at the end of that, just different things she kept repeating over and over again. And did you notice how, so I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this throughout the whole morning. But every one of us, from the beginning when, I, when we walked through what does steadfast faith look like, what's the purpose of it, to today, every one of them was clinging to the word of God. Right? Every single one of them. Which we're going to go through more and more throughout this morning. Today... We're going to continue to look at, those, that, look at that fire that consumes all of the impurities in our lives. All the things that get in the way of us having steadfast faith. We're going to look as God, at God 
as the consuming fire. As the consuming fire. He identifies himself and calls himself the consuming fire. That's one of the names of God. And we're going to see why. So as we looked at this weekend verse of James, you should probably memorize it by now, right? James 1, 1 through 4, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes dispersed. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know, now ladies, you can say, you know, right? The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in absolutely nothing. Remember what perfect means. It wasn't one of Becky's three Ps. <laughs> what does perfect mean? Coming to the absolute end of yourself. We can create and let him create in us something beautiful. And we can cling to him because our God is immovable. Isn't it awesome to know our God is absolutely immovable? I shared with some of you uh, the first night, a couple of you, we're talking about, we were talking about fear and like, what do we get to the point of what if something does happen? What if, what if my biggest fear happens? What if? You know, there's a time and season in my life, you know, when, when Jeff had taken me um, after I had shared with him absolutely everything I had done a year and a half into our, our marriage, I shared all of the sins I can remember, everything that caused me so, so much pain. And he looked at me and he said, he's a baby, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That is not who you are. And I love you. And I, for the first time in my life, saw a man who was a year-old believer, by the way, show me what the love of God looked like that I had never seen before. In all the years I did, I, I was growing up in the church. All the years I went to church, my entire life, new scripture. But it was the first time I actually saw what love looked like. That unconditional, I love you beyond you, love. You know what I'm talking about? Um... So as I continued, I grew in the Lord, and I started just walking with him and digging into his word. Jeff was always a representation of that love for me. And there was a moment in time where the Lord had to get, we had to come to Jesus moment, where he said, you know what, you love your husband so much, which is why I gave you a helpmate. But that husband cannot be your only representation of love. You've got to surrender him to me. I was deathly afraid of losing him. Even the thought of something actually happening to him would cripple me. I couldn't even share it. I remember talking to Jan years ago, and I remember saying, I know, Jan, I know that God can do anything, and I know when I pray, I know he can, but I'm scared to death of what he actually will do. That's the one thing. Take anything in the world, but, but don't touch him. Don't touch him. It was the biggest fear I had. See, when I start crying, then I cry throughout the whole thing. You're just going to have to bear with me. <laughs> you know, it was the one thing that I couldn't just let go of. And God had to get, I remember I was sitting in the kitchen by myself. And one morning, um, he was in, he went to Vero Beach, was about 40 minutes away. And he had a meeting. He said, okay, I'll be home by noon. I'll see you. You know, I'll be there, whatever. And so I... Uh, you know, I was expecting him to come home. I couldn't, I, I called him and went straight to voicemail, went straight to voicemail, went straight to voicemail. I couldn't get a hold of him. It was two o'clock, then three o'clock, then four o'clock. And then about 6.30, I was a puddling mess. He hadn't called me. He, I couldn't, I didn't know where he was. I called the hospitals. I called my sister because I'm like, I need you. I can't, I can't even talk. Can you please just call these numbers? Because I can't, I can't get a hold of anybody, you know? And I dropped to the floor in tears. And the Lord was like, Jessica, do you see? You are clinging so tight to this man. So tight. You have to let him go. And at that moment, you know, he didn't call until almost 7.30 that evening. And he was like, babe, I'm so sorry. I had meeting after meeting after meeting. Obviously, he's still here today. I had meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. But see, that moment in time at the bureau, he didn't have any service. You know, hold on, yards. But 
It was at that moment that I was on the floor crying out to the Lord and he was saying, babe, you have to go there. You have to allow yourself to go there. You have to allow me to be your all in all. You have to. So what if something happened to him? What, what would you do? What would you do? I was like, I'd be a mess. I can't even think about it. I can't even let myself think about it. And he was like, okay, then what if? What if? Where would you be after that? I'm like, well, well, I'm staying in Florida because there's no way I'm going back to Colorado. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I love you, Mom, if you ever listen to this. Um, <laughs> you know, what if? What if he did? What if? What if? And at the end of the day, after I've gone through every emotion and every tear and every freak out panic mode, I was like my daughter on a, on a roller coaster ride, like panic clinging to anything I could cling to until finally he, he pried every finger off of anything I could ever hold as stability. And he said, now what if? And I sat there and I'm like, you are still God. You are still God. And at the end of the day, I will still serve you. Because I'm telling you, ladies, at the beginning of that freak out panic mode, I was, I was telling him, God, you can take whatever you want, but don't touch him. And if you do, I don't know if I will. I don't know if I will. I don't know if I can. But at the end of the day, at the, at the, at the, before I talked to him, right before I talked to him, I said, I will still serve you. I will still honor you. I will still walk with you. I will still love you. And it was like a, a burden and it just whoo, fallen right off my shoulders. And then I get the phone call. I'm so sorry. I'm like, thank God you're alive. <laughs> I was dying, you know, but God had to take me there. He had to bring me through that so that I could just say, and guess what? I had to do it with my son, my other son, and my daughter. But those three were a whole lot easier, a whole lot easier after I walked through that. And I'll tell you, I, I, I had a conversation with one of y'all this, this weekend. I said, this is what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to do it. You're going to have to let, let, let them go. And it's painful. And it's torturous. But at the end of the day, there's no greater freedom than going, you know what? No matter what happens to me, I have no more fears. I have no more bondages. I have no more stumbling blocks for me to hurl over. I am totally free to say, whatever you want for my life, God, I'm willing. Whatever you want, I'm willing. So we can let. You can let him create something in you beautiful. And you can cling to him because our God is immovable. Our God, by the way, never changes. He doesn't even have moods like us. He doesn't get tired of us. Yeah. Thank God. He doesn't get tired of us. Right? He doesn't. He's consistent and constant. Can you guys please turn with me to Hebrews 12? Hebrews 12. We're going we're gonna to look at verse 25 through 29. But I'm going to start in verse 18. Okay, so as we're looking at the context of this, um, Paul is writing and he's basically saying, he's giving an example between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And I'll explain as we go, but let's look at verse four, uh, 18 first. And he's talking to believers and he's saying, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind. Thank you. Here, the bomb.com. <laughs> and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which set, which I can't even see. Woo! <laughs> the sound was, was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them, for they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so, and so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. Verse 22, but you, you need to underline that. But you have come to Mount Zion, underline that, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the, the myriads of, of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of all righteous made perfect. 
and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Can you please underline or highlight, if you have it, from 22 to 23, or 24, sorry. But you have come to Mount Zion. You have come to Mount Zion. So again, this is a Jewish letter to the Jewish Christian, or a Christian letter, really, to the Jewish Christians, where Paul is just giving them this example. They knew about Mount Zion, or Mount Sinai, and they knew about Zion. So in Scripture, Sinai... Mount Sinai literally means thorny. Okay, this was this was what they were came, they came from. So if you can think about the Old Testament, the the legalisms, you know, say, holding fast to the law, um, religion. Moses, you know, was on Mount Sinai. Okay, when, when he saw the burning bush, which is ironic. Okay, fire. Um, this this is really marked by fear. This means barren and desolate. This is what we are before we come to Mount Zion. And Mount Zion, Mount Zion literally means mountain of the Lord, okay? Mountain of the Lord. Mount Zion is a picture of God's grace marked with mercy, a city of God. Everyone can come and make and be right with God. See, on Mount Sinai, only Moses could go, right? But everyone can come to Mount Zion. Everyone can make be right with God. The whole purpose of Mount Zion, or Mount Sinai, and then is to point people to Mount Zion. So as we walk through our faith and, and before we come to the Lord, we see religion, we see the law, we see the things that we can't ever measure up to, right? We see like, man, this is, this is what we are before the cross of Jesus Christ. And then when we come to Mount Zion, this is what we are after, okay? This sacrifice of Christ is an invitation for all of us to come to Mount Zion. And where is Jesus going to come back in the second coming? Mount Zion, right? That's where his feet are going to touch. So he's giving them this example, and he's saying, you no longer, you're no longer on Mount Sinai, guys. You're, you are now on Mount Zion. So stop living like you're on Mount Sinai. You know, the same thing for us, too. The greatest hindrance to the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen to me, ladies. The greatest hindrance to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace that is offered to us is legalistic Christianity. The greatest hindrance. All that does is put a burden back on that was taken off and put on the cross. All that does is say, you know what, if you live such and such and such a way, then you can be right with God. Even though, yes, I know grace covers us, but if you're doing this, 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 and this, you must not be as spiritual as I am. We wouldn't say that. But man, you put, you put on that legal, legalistic attitude, you will, that is the quickest way to repel people from Christ. The quickest way. We have to be careful. So that's what Paul's saying. He's like, you know what? Stop. Stop. You're no longer held to a legalistic law. You are freed by the grace and the mercy of the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, I tell my ladies all the time, guys, keep the main thing the main thing. You want to fight for something? Fight for them to know the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on the cross. Stop worrying about all these little things. And I'll tell you, as we get closer and closer to Christ's return, there's going to be more and more little things. Because our world is full of sin and death. And yes, you want to encourage them to live righteously, but you know what makes them live righteously? Not your encouragement. The cross does. The cross does. Every time I have watched a sister in Christ or a brother in Christ come to the Lord, man, they come with a whole lot of baggage and a whole lot of sin and a whole lot of patterns of yuck, right? We all did. But who's the one that sheds the baggage? Jesus does. Man, let him do that work. Keep the main thing the main thing. Share the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is giving them a warning. He's not called you to Mount Sinai. He's not called you to legalism. He's not called you to rules and, oh, you're so busy focusing on what everybody else should be doing. That's another thing I want to do for you right now. I want you to stop. There's a lot of moms in here. There's a lot of daughters in here. There's a lot of sisters in here. There's a lot of friends in here. I want you to stop right now and resolve. This message is for you and you alone. I want you to stop thinking about who should be here, who isn't here, how they should listen to this, 
how they should hear. Her. Oh, wow, man, where's that recording? I'm going to send that. No. I want you to take this as the Spirit of God speaking to your heart personally. It's not about anybody else. It's about the Spirit of God speaking to you so you can hear him, so you can respond to him. Amen? Amen. You can breathe. Okay, let's look at verse 25. We're going to go through verse 25 through 27, and then um, we're going to... We'll keep going. I'll show you. All right, 25. It says, see to it. Here's his admonishment. See to it. It's Hebrews 12. I'm sorry. 25. 27. See to it that you do not refuse him. This him, you should, if you mark your Bibles at all, um, every reference to God, to the Holy Spirit, and the Father, I, I, would, I would really strongly encourage it. Okay, So you can know as you go through scripture, you know, it pulls out who's speaking, and you usually will see a capital letter when you know it's, it's, it's the Lord, but highlight it, mark it somehow. Okay, See to it that you do not refuse who? Yeah. Who is speaking. Who? For if those did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warn us from, from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of, of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, that's Mount Zion, let's show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Why? Verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. For our God is consuming fire. All right, let's go back to 25. See to it. See to it literally means to discern or keep seeing. Don't stop seeing. Okay, this is a continual. Okay, this is a command to keep on seeing. That what? What does it say? Keep on seeing that you do not. Okay, refuse means to decline or avoid. I know just even by some stories that I heard this weekend, you've been avoiding the Lord's voice. And it's time to deal with what he wants to deal with in your heart. See to it that you don't avoid, that you don't refuse him, that you don't decline what he's speaking to your heart. And 26 says, and his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. So he's warning of the things to come. And then he explains right here in Hebrews, he's saying, he's quoting Haggai 2.6, if you want to put that in your Bibles, Haggai 2.6. And he explains it in 27. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of the th those things which can be shaken. As of created things. Why? So that things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's beautiful. It's a warning. Don't reject the Lord when he speaks. Don't reject him when he speaks. Hebrew 10, Hebrews 10, 35 through 39. You can write it down. Or you can go there with me if you want. It's just a couple pages over because you're already in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 35 to 39 says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of what? Endurance or steadfastness. You have need of steadfastness. So that when you have done all the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Listen, do you hear this, guys? For yet in a little while, he is coming. And I'll tell you right now, he is at the door. He is at the door. We are watching this world fall right into place. It's not falling apart. We have no need to fear. Our God has not surrendered his authority on his throne. Amen? Amen. But he is coming. And the message we need to stand firm on, get ready. Don't refuse him as he speaks today. Listen up. It says, for a while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. Who is his righteous one? Us. 
his saints. We will live by what? Faith. But I'll tell you, faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. We have to live by faith. We can't just go, oh, I have a little bit of faith here, and maybe, oh, my faith is strong. No, we live by faith. We have to live, dwell, remain in faith. Because the times will get more and more evil. And if he shrinks back, if he avoids, if he pulls back, if he closes his ears, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not among those who shrink back. Amen? Amen. We are not among those who shrink back to destruction, but to, of those who have faith for the safekeeping of the soul. See why this, this whole conference is so important. I don't care if you're a brand new baby believer or if you've been walking with the Lord for 50 years. This message is applicable and vital for every single one of us in every season of our lives. Do you get it? There, there is no woman in this room that is more spiritual than you are, ladies. It's not just you wake up one day and go, man, I want to have passion for God like that. You know what it takes? It takes fire after fire after fire after fire. And just when you feel like you're starting to get up, you get another fire. This church planting experience from planting from, from scratch has been fire after fire after woo, rejoice, and then boom, there's another fire. I'm like, all right, Lord, let's hold on because there's going to be more fires. And you know what's happened? He has brought a refining beauty that would have never, ever been able to, to be without the fires. Nobody is more spiritual than anybody else. We all are stinking hot messes. I'm sorry if you came in here thinking you were. You're not. <laughs> You're not. This woman who stands before you is a broken, broken vessel. And the cry of my heart is for his glory to shine through. There's nothing, nothing. And I'm giving you, wait, this whole weekend is giving you tiny little things to go, this is how you cling. This is how you cling. This is how you hold fast. And all you have to do is let him do it. And don't let go. Don't let go. This is unshakable faith. We have to be resolved to not let go. We have to be resolved to cry, no matter what. <laughs> no matter what. I will not budge. I will not move. I'm not going to stop following my Jesus. I don't care what I lose. I don't care what I have to give up. I will not stop following my Jesus. No relationship on the planet, ladies, is more important than your Jesus. None. And I'll tell you, it is the biggest temptation of the enemy to try to put in something or some other desire, other green grass that looks greener than yours. You know why it looks greener? I love this meme. Because it's over a septic tank. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? <laughs> nothing, nothing can get in the way of your Jesus. Keep holding on to that. And here's the question you need to write in your notes. How is my resolve here? How's my resolve? Because it's, it's so important, ladies, and it's easy to say on a, on a conference where you're away all weekend long and you're, man, this is awesome, woohoo! But you need to decide what your resolve is today. Because I'll tell you, it'll be so hard to decide that in the middle of the fire. Decide it today. Make a covenant with the Lord. No matter what I go through, no matter how hard the struggle is, no matter how deep the pain is, I will not move, I will not budge. No matter what. You have to decide that now. You can't decide it when all your emotions, what did you call it, a ball of emotions going Feelings ball. Feelings ball. You know, in the middle of that, it's a whole lot harder to make a decision whether I'm resolved or not. Because what we do is we start to justify it, right? Well, you know, this isn't so bad. It's not that, right? Anybody? Make a decision now. Now in my resolve. And keep holding on for dear life. All right, so this expression in verse 27, this expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things 
so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Guess what remain means? This is really cool. <laughs> Nino, abide, right? Abide. You'd think that we connected this from last year. You know, it's funny too, Angela, she's the bomb as well, dot com. So she's like in there, she's like, you know what's so cool? We went through abide last year and, and biting and remaining in the vine. And then this year we're, we're going through steadfast faith and this a fire. Well, once you start abiding and you like are clinging to that, she's like, then what's going to happen right after you abide? Fires. <laughs> it's all, it's all hooking together. But yes, this word remain is the same word in steadfastness. When I said hypomino, the mino, remain under, is, remain is mino, the mino part of steadfastness. I didn't plan this, by the way. I just, I didn't. <laughs> like, I'm not that cool. That's only God. But it is so stinking cool. It's like the exact same word. Remain, remain, abide, and, and that hypomino, remain under. Spurgeon says this. Here's my favorite. Glory be to God. Our kingdom cannot be moved. Not even dynamite can touch our dominion. No power in the world and no power in hell can shake the kingdom which the Lord has given to his saints. With Jesus as our monarch, we fear no revolution and no anarchy. For the Lord hath established this kingdom upon a rock, and it cannot move nor be removed. Isn't that awesome? Ja! Like, Lord, you bless this man with a whole lot of words, and it is amazing. We have an unshakable God. He will not move, and there's nothing that can remove him. He never changes. He's trying to create in you, ladies, an unshakable faith. An unshakable faith. We, we move, we alter, we go up, we go down. But man, when he creates in us trial after fire, after trial after fire, he's creating in us an unshakable faith that will stand firm in every season, every fire and every situation. Look at 28 with me. It says, therefore, since all of this, since we've received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, we've established that, right? We know our kingdom can't be shaken, our God cannot be shaken. We, what does it say, which cannot be shaken, let's show gratitude by which we offer, we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. All right, let's take this apart. This word receive means to join oneself with, okay? Not just once, but keep on receiving. This is a I know nerdy, just get over it. Present active participle. So what that means, okay? In this moment, you're receiving, and you're going to continue to receive. It's not just a one-time thing, okay? King, with this kingdom, this word kingdom is dominion and king, kingship and rule. I've been here. Kingdom has principles and ways. And the more we walk these out in your life, the more you look like a citizen of that kingdom, and the more you will look like that king. Do you hear that? the more you will look like the king. Cling to the one who cannot be shaken. You know, I remember when we started planning a church, and, and uh, God had called, well, before that, when God had called us to plan a church, you know, and I, the Lord had revealed to me, you know, it's time for, he needs to, you know, Jeff needs to quit his job. And we had literally two months of income in the bank and two little kids, very, very tiny boys. I had just had Jace. And the Lord had revealed it to my heart before Jeff had told me. And, um, and I told my mom on the phone, I remember I was in Cape Coral, and I told my mom, I said, Mom, I feel like Jeff's supposed to quit his job. She was like, what are you talking about? That's crazy. I was like, yeah, I know it's crazy, but I do. I just feel like the Lord is preparing that. And um, two days later, he came to me, and he said, babe, I need you to sit down. <laughs> it's like, I really feel like the Lord's calling me to quit my job. And I was like, I already know the God's already told me. <laughs> He's like, what? I'm like, I knew it. I knew that you, the Lord was going to call. We didn't know anything about church planning at the time. We just went, you know what, God? I don't know what you're doing. We're both on the same page. I am in weird peace <laughs> about this, and we're just going to jump off a cliff. Well, during that time, we said, okay, you know what? We're just going to offer our lives to the Lord. And so we took 10 days, and we fasted during those 10 days. And during the 10 days, we wrote down goals. We wrote down spiritual goals. We wrote down goals. You know, hit one of his is to baptize his grandchildren. Just different things, but we did it separately. And we didn't share until the end of the 10 days. And so... At the end of the 10 days, we came together and we went through the list. Um, and I just went through it recently. It's just so cool to see God's faithfulness. That some things that I thought were just my fleshly desires were actually a plan of God. And it's just cool. That's another story for another time. But 
so as we're, as we're going through this, and he, he, he's reading them, and he's like, one of them was to plant a church. And I was like, ha ha, maybe 20 years from now. <laughs> but no way. So I laughed. I'm like, it's not, on my, it's not on my list, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> God didn't tell me, so I don't know. No, so, um, so we sat there, and he's like, babe, I just don't understand. Like, our, our church doesn't plant churches. They do satellite campuses, and that is not my heart. I don't want to do a satellite campus. I said, well, you know what? We'll just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to do whatever he's going to do. So this was, this was in like October, November. In January, our pastor stood up and he said the Lord had given him a vision and to start just stretching the tent pegs and start planting churches. And we like, you know those moments? I know you know those moments because you tell me about these moments as well. When you feel like the Holy Spirit of God just went, whoo, and the spotlight was right on you and you're like, how in the world did you know that? You know, that's how we felt. And I just felt like all the heat came off, you know, through my face. I'm like, this is real. Like, he was right. He just wants from God. So, um, you know, and Jeff had met with the pastor and he looked at him and he's like, Jeff, man, I could think of no one better. You're going to be an awesome shepherd. And he's like, go, do, you know. And so we did this like AA for church planners, you know, like <laughs> nobody knows. Calvary Melbourne is like 10,000 people and nobody had actually planted a church from Calvary Melbourne. So we were the guinea pigs of this whole group. There was 10 guys that felt like God was calling them to plant a church. And so we sat around and going, what do we do? I don't know. What are you going to do? I don't know. Where are you going to go? I don't know. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was interesting. But um, we went through that process and, and really going, man, we know nothing, but we do know that God is calling and we do know it's going to be a church plant. And long story short, we felt called to Georgia. Didn't know anybody in Georgia. I've never been really. We went to one vacation here years ago, um, but we felt drawn. And so we traveled around the state and prayed about different areas and, you know, different, um, you know, like uh, types of people and types of, you know, growth periods, whatever. So we're looking at all of these things. And we came to, to coming and my kids had strep and it was like the worst spiritual moment in the world because I was so irritated. I was mad. I wanted coffee. All I wanted to do like we were in a camper that ran out of propane you just I mean everything that could go wrong absolutely went wrong and these other places we visited were really sweet when we were going to plant a little at Rome and there was a guy that was like yeah come I'll give you 40 of my people you plant on that side and we're gonna we're gonna reach the city for the gospel that sounds awesome we didn't have a peace we shouldn't have a peace it was not where God wanted us and so we come to coming and it's like Bleh! and I'll tell you see you think, this is, the, this is the problem with our human brain. When we think things are going well, God's in it. When we think things are going, when things are horrible, we think, well, God, where are you? He's actually working in the horrible. He doesn't really work in the awesome very much. So if you're in an awesome season, get ready, because the horrible is about ready to come. So, yeah, it's just reality. I'm sorry to tell you that. If you haven't figured that out already. So we, it, was, it was absolutely horrible, but in this time period, I remember going like, God, practically on paper, man, this is the scariest thing we've ever done. We know nobody. We don't know a soul. Not one. It's our tiny family. I'm pregnant. I have two babies to take care of. How is a mom with all of these things to juggle? How am I going to do this? And I remember going through, and it's been a blessing because I just got to teach through this in Mark, but I remember going through Mark and going through where the woman was bleeding. You remember that when she went and she pushed through the crowd and she went and she touched the robe of Jesus. And he says, your faith has made you well, you know? And so I remember going through that and going, oh, all right, Lord, I want that faith. I'm like, forget it. I'm not touching your robe. I'm going to wrap myself all up in it. <laughs> just hold me, right? And I remember him saying, Jessica, if you just keep your eyes like this, just keep your eyes like this. I'll carry you every step of the way. And he has done just that. You cling with everything you have. Cling to the one that will not be shaken. I was shaken all over the place. All over the place. What's going to happen? How is this going to work? Who's going to, how are we going to reach people? What? And look what God's done. Look what God's done. We just cling to the one who cannot be moved. Cling to the one who can't be moved. So since we're part of this kingdom, right? So that... You are part of this kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let's do these things, right? We're going to talk about, so what do you do? How do you do it? And then why you do it, okay? What, how, and why? What, how, and why? First thing, what does he say? Let's what? Show gratitude. That means to hold or possess grace and loving kindness. Hold or possess grace and loving kindness. Show gratitude by which or through that, what? It says we may 
offer, which means to serve God, offer God an acceptable service, which means a manner well-pleasing to him. And service means to minister or to serve, a manner well-pleasing to him. Offer acceptable service. How do we do this? Okay, so that's the what. We show gratitude and we offer acceptable service. And then how? He tells us not just what to do, but how to do it. What attitude to do it. What does it say? With what? Reverence and awe. With reverence and awe. Reverence means caution, discretion, and godly fear. You guys know this scripture. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I'll tell you what. I was talking with one of the ladies last night. You know, the more I grow in the Lord, the more I fall in love with him, the more this responsibility, the more that what we do in teaching the word and handling it with, with just accuracy scares me to death. It's a very scary thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And it is the most beautiful privilege in the world, but one that I do not take, and I know it teach the word, my husband does not take it lightly. Does not take it lightly. Having the fear of God, having that reverence and awe, it's not a terrifying fear. He's going to strike me dead, which man has tainted. It's a holy stinking cow. This God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And when I stand before him, I will be accountable for every idle word I speak. That should bring fear to us. And a good fear. Because what does that fear do? What does it do? It motivates, right? It drives us into the throne room of God, and it drives us to be clean, right? It drives us to go, you know what? I will not budge, because I don't want to stand before him, right? Knowing that I didn't deal with what he wanted to do with me, right? There's a godly fear, and then it says awe. Oh. This shows a sense of honor, modesty and regard and respect this is a respect of god this is honoring the lord man this is whew. you know living in colorado we would see bears all the time all the time and this and bears and like rattlesnakes and different things like that those are the types of things like you know when you come upon a bear or especially even with a mountain lion one time i was hiking with a friend of mine and we bears i'm not even concerned about my dad was a divisional wildlife manager so he would catch bears all the time and whatever it wasn't that big of a deal until when you see a mountain lion, <laughs> it's the scariest thing in the world. That's that, <gasps> that woo, I know what this thing can do, right? Like, holy cow, I'm just going to slowly back myself out of this situation, right? But that's, that's the type of fear of the Lord, like, <gasps> I know how powerful he is. I know how holy he is. It's just like Isaiah when he stood before the presence of God and said, whoa, is me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And it brought him to this place of humility. Humility. You want to be humble? You want to be used by God? Have a right fear of the Lord. Have a right fear of the Lord so he can use you. And then 29, here's the why. Why? Have reverence. Have awe. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. Consuming fire. Consume Consuming means to consume, consume okay? To, the word consume can have different meanings. It means to, to use up, to destroy, and I like this word, to annihilate. Annihilate. To absorb the attention of someone or something. To annihilate. Okay, consuming fire. In scripture, it literally means fiery fire. And usually, when you look at, at different themes throughout Scripture, like the oil of the Holy Spirit, and you see things in the Old Testament that represent a, a truth or um, a symbolic. Uh, fire in Scripture usually means judgment. You know, the, the atonement and the sacrifices. It burns up the, the, the sin. It burns up. It's in judgment. It consumes it. Um. So this is really cool. Whatever touches our Lord, listen to this quote, whatever touches him does not affect him. He affects what he touches. What touches him does not affect him, but he affects what he touches. Isn't that beautiful? It was true. So consuming fire. 
the very consuming fire of God is what takes us from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. So does, why does God refer himself to a consuming fire? And what does he consume? She's going to be putting up slides in here. And so I'm sorry for you guys if you have to like twist your neck back and forth. You can look up here. You can write your notes from here um, and see as we go through the different notes. But the consuming fire of God. What does the consuming fire of God consume and why? Okay. Why does he define himself as a consuming fire? First one is this. What does fire consume? Unrighteousness and judgment. Unrighteousness and judgment. Fire represents judgment in scripture, like I just said. It consumes the unrighteousness. Without Christ, we are hopeless. We are consumed. Jesus took on the full wrath of God on our behalf, and we can stand before him, before a holy, holy God, and be free. So when Christ was on the cross, he consumed all of that. He took on all of our wrath. He took on all of our judgment on himself. You know, we went through the book of Mark, um, and the end of it, we went, of course, did the cross. And the process in which <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and where Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit all came together in that moment. And when Jesus took on the wrath, we think about the physical ailments because we are so stupid sheep. We think about the fact that, man, he went to the cross and he hated, man, the pain and the, yes, it was, he was fully human and it was terrible. But what really he said when he prayed in the garden, he said, Lord, there's any other way to take this cup from me. It was taking on every bit of wrath and judgment. The fire of God, the consuming fire of God was put on him. And he had to be separated from his father. It was not about the physical. It was about the spiritual. The wrath that only should have been us, right? It should have been ours. It should have consumed us. And he said, I'm going to take on that fire because that fire has to consume unrighteousness to be refined and pure and holy. And he took our place. Hebrews 10, 27 says, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. Ezekiel, you don't need to write that down, but Ezekiel 28, 18. Ezekiel 28, 18. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sacrifices. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. I have consumed you and have turned you to ashes in the earth and in the eyes of all who see you. These are just scriptures that are talk about the consuming of unrighteousness, the consuming of sin. Isaiah 66, 16 says, For the Lord will execute judgment by fire and by his sword all the flesh, and those slain by the Lord will will be many. Gusick says, Our God is a consuming fire. Since God is a, in fact a consuming fire, we do best to come to him on his terms. These are the terms of the unmerited approval of Jesus. He will consume all that is outside of that sphere. You hear that? These are the terms of unmerited approval in, in Jesus. He will consume all that is outside of that sphere. The truth that God is a consuming fire is a comfort to the believer. They realized that the Father poured out his consuming fire of judgment on the Son in our place. When he did it, he completely consumed the guilt of sin in all who believe. The penalty of sin was consumed on the cross. The second thing, awesome, I forgot about that there. The second thing that the fire, the consuming fire of God consumes is idols or idolatry. We could do a whole conference on idolatry. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's a lot. But this is huge. Deuteronomy 4, put this down because this is the reference in scripture of consuming fire of God. Deuteronomy 4, 23 through 24 says this, Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. We need to rem remember that, guys. Be careful not to forget the covenant the Lord made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, and he is a jealous God. He is a consuming fire. Don't forget the covenant of the Lord. I want you guys to turn with me to 1 Kings. First Kings 18. First Kings 18, 17 through 40. 
All right. <clears throat> All right, we know the story of Elijah, right? What happens with Elijah? We went through this recently with the Thyatira, Church of Thyatira. What, what happened with Elijah? Okay, the fire before that. Let's get context. What happened with Elijah? Who is Elijah? He's a prophet of the Lord, right? Who's the king right now? Ahab. Ahab. And his wife? Whoo. That stinking Jezebel, right? Okay, Jezebel, what did she do? <laughs> yeah, she killed prophets. She put, set up idolatry. She wooed men into making sure that they would worship these idols. She was terrible. Terrible. Okay? All right. So, Elijah. <laughs> Let's start in verse 17. Just giving us con uh, you know, context. It says, Now, it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, "What do you have to do? With, what do I have? What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to to remembrance and to put my sin, my son to death." He said to her, "Give me your son." And then he took him from her bosom and carried him to the upper room where they were living. Am I in the right place? I was like, "This isn't making sense." This too is not what I'm reading. Oh wait. Okay, wait. No, yeah. Oh, I was a 17. That's why. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't remember this part. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's, not, let's ignore that. Okay. Now we're going to the second, first Kings 18, not 17. All right. Verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is Ahab, bad king, is this you? You troubler of Israel. He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you, your father's house, have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. All right, so what does he say to Elijah here? And that's why I got confused. I was like, what have you done with me, you old man of God? I'm like, that's kind of the same thing. He's saying, what? I have I've troubled Israel, but you have your father's house. Have, have No, no, he says, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? He's like, I didn't trouble Israel. You're mad at me, but it's actually God who's doing, who's doing all the work. I'm just the mouthpiece. I love that. I'm sorry. I love that. It's personal. <laughs> now, then, <laughs> now then, send and gather to me all of Israel to Mount Carmel together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah and eat that, who eat at Jezebel's table. Wow. Verse 20. Okay, we got that number? 850, right? So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought all the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate, hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord God, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. And then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. And now let them give us two oxen. And let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood. But put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of who? Of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that's a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare, prepare it first, for you are many, <clears throat> and call on the name of, of your God, but put no fire under it. And then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us, morning until noon. Answer us. But there was what? No voice. And no one what? Answered. Answered. And they leaped out of their altar, which, was, which, which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them. This is hilarious. What does he say? Call out with a loud voice, for he is a good God. He is God. Either he is occupied, or maybe he's gone aside. Or is, what, on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep. And he needs to be awakened. I love him. I cannot wait until we see him in heaven. Okay, so they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves. Cut themselves. Listen to that. That's a whole other teaching we can go off on. According to their custom and their swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, 
They raved until the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, <laughs> according to the number... <laughs> To the number of the tribes of the sons of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And so the stones were built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. And he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four pitchers of water and pour it on the burnt offering on the wood. He said, Do it a second time. And they said it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar. And he, and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And I have done all these things in your, in your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me, that this place may, may, know, may know that you, O oh Lord, are God. And that you have turned their hearts back again. Then the fire, 38, underline it. The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah said to him, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. Holy moly, right? Isn't that awesome? He not only said, okay, let's do it this way, but I'm going to actually add water on, and I'm going to add water around. And you watch what my God will do. You watch what my God will do. He will consume all of your idols, right? He will consume this altar. It's beautiful. Spurgeon says, of course, here we go. Whatever a man depends on, whatever rules his mind, whatever governs his actions, listen to this, whatever is the chief object of his delight is his God. Do you hear that? Whatever a man depends on, whatever rules his mind, whatever governs his, his affections, whatever is the chief object of his delight is his God. See, when I was on the floor wrestling with the Lord to let my husband go, it was in that moment I realized, man, this is misplaced worship. This is misplaced worship. I would never have told you I worship my husband, let me tell you, no way. But in my heart, he sat on the throne. I had to let him go. I had to let the consuming fire of God consume. Ed Stetzer says, our idols are not golden calves or carved statues. Idolatry is not tied to any specific idol. It exists whenever we look at someone or something in the world around us to save and to satisfy us. I've shared this waterfall analogy over and over again because it is so important it's so important. When we first moved here, I went to Amicola Falls, which is one of the biggest waterfalls in all of Georgia. And it's beautiful. It's breathtaking. And there's this place where you can stand that's a bridge if you have not been there. And you can, you're like in the middle of the waterfall. And I remember just worshiping the Lord and just praying and the, just watching this, this massive waterfall flow. And, and it was before we even really started the church. It was like right when we moved there. And he, the Lord had given me such a beautiful picture of saying, you know what? I am, I am this waterfall. I am the top. Of the, I am the source. I am the power. I am everything in this waterfall. And you are just a vessel. You're just a vessel. I want to pour through you. I want to use you. But man, you got to make sure that vessel's clean so that I can do what I want to do in you. And see, the problem that we have, guys, is this, and I, it's such a beautiful picture, is so often we go to the end of that waterfall and we, we, we expect everybody else to fill and satisfy and save. And we start trying to splash up the water and try to get source and strength and, and power from other things and other people. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. You've got to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit of God to pour through you. But you cannot expect to get fully satisfied by trying to get at the bottom of a, pool, a puddle and trying to, to get water. You can't. No one on the planet can satisfy you. No one can fill the place that only God can fill in your life. No one. Tim Keller says, the true God of your heart is what your thoughts effortlessly go to. She's going to put it up. 
The true God of your heart is what your thoughts, listen, effortlessly go to when there is nothing else demanding your attention. Whew. Take a deep breath, as I know that's convicting. It's what your thoughts effortlessly go to when there's nothing else demanding your attention. There you will find what you worship. See, when we make for ourselves an idol, we give that person, that thing, that idol glory that only belongs to God. And we expect it to fill. We expect us it to supply. And then we get angry when it doesn't. Anybody, ever, anybody who's married? <laughs> Did you ever go into your marriage expecting that your husband would supply all your needs? No. Good for you. <laughs> You have, yeah, you have friendships, you have, you have family, you have parents, you have people in your life where, man, there is a deep hole that I'm just longing. Can you fill it, please? No one will be able to fill that but your God. So why does God's consuming fire burn up idols in your life? Why? Because he longs to reveal his glory and his majesty in your life. He alone is to be worshipped. Second Chronicles Seven, one through three. It says, When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven. Second Chronicles seven, one through three. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good and his love endures forever. So that's exactly what God wants to do in our hearts. I want, he wants to show us his glory so that we can fall down on our faces and worship him and cry out, he is good. His love endures forever no matter how hot the fire is. God is good. His glory consumes everything, everything around it. Nothing else can stand in his presence. There is no presence. If God, if, in God's presence, there is no room for idol worship. You're struggling with an idol? Get on your face before the Lord. There is no room for idol worship in the presence of God. All of those things will be burned away when you see the majesty and the glory of God. So what else is the consuming fire of God consume? We see in scripture in Deuteronomy 9, 3, we see God's consuming fire consumes our enemies. It says, but be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across, across ahead of you like a devouring fire. He will destroy them, he will subdue them before you, and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly, as the Lord promised you. So in contents, this was for the Israelites, and because of the plan of God to bring them about their Messiah through his chosen people. This is not a scripture to be taken out of context. <laughs> you see this? It is not. Be assured. Do not take this out of context. So before you start making lists of all people who have wronged you, <laughs> that is not how this works. <laughs> God removes and destroys enemies in your life when doing so aligns with his purpose and his plan. Keep in mind, more times than not, okay? Y'all listen to this. This is important. More times than not, he may very well keep those enemies there for the exact same reason. For the exact same reason. That reason is your sanctification and your steadfastness. So what are our enemies? Now that I burst your bubble, what are our enemies? Listen, anything that gets in the way or stops us from fulfilling God's plan and will for our lives. Young ladies, teenagers, listen to that. There's going to be all kinds of desires and all kinds of things being pulling at you for all of your life. If you can hold fast to that and you don't let anything get in the way of your relationship with God, you will be a woman of God that will be used by him and there will be no limit to that. 
There'll be no limit to that. All right, so who's our enemies? First of all, we know what's the most obvious. Satan, right? Satan, 1 Peter 5, 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary or your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a what? Roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Revelation 19, 20 says the devil and, who have, uh, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So the fire of God consumes our enemy, Satan. So the second thing, the second enemy we have is sin and death. Romans 6, 16 says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? It's a powerful verse. Don't forget to write it down. Either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Do you not know that when you present yourself as someone as a slave, you're going to be a slave to one thing or another. You become a slave to the one you obey. You obey your flesh, guess what? You'll become a slave to it in no time. You obey the, the Lord, man, righteousness is sure to follow. Sin and death was consumed on the cross. One of the biggest enemies God is seeking to devour in your life is sin. The biggest enemy in your life is not Satan. It is sin. Your biggest problem is, I say this all the time, inside of you, not outside of you. Ladies, your biggest problem is not your family, is not your husband, is not your children, is not anyone else but your own sin. The only thing that can interfere or destroy the work and the plan of God in your life is sin. Sin separates you from God. As powerful as Satan may be, he is no match for the man or woman who has chosen to follow God with their whole heart. But when sin invades the heart, it can wreak havoc on God's purpose and will for your life. Third enemy is this. The world. John 15, 18 through 19. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Because of this world, because this world hates you. Because of this, this world hates you. So why does God consume our enemies? He consumes our enemies because you are his workmanship, okay? You are not to be creating for yourself an idol to worship because he is creating for himself a beautiful work of art. You are his workmanship, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is, not, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, so that you would walk in them. So what else does God's consuming fire consume? Number three, the third thing that God's fire consumes. Okay, I know you're note takers. The, the three of your, your, the enemy, sin, and uh, the world is part of your um, it goes under your other one. It goes underneath what kind of enemies does God consume. This is now your bondage. Is it four? Bondage. This is what God's fire consumes. Bondage. All right, Luke 4, 16 through 21 says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought, this is Jesus, brought up, and as, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. Scripture. I wish we had time to go through his book in detail. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because I have anoint he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind. He has set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And I love this. He reads it. He stands up. He is the fulfillment of that scripture at that moment, and then 20 said that he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. <laughs> Our God is in this house, right? <laughs> Woo! He sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him, and began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Can you imagine being in that place? 
They have memorized that scripture. They have gone over it and over it and over it. And for that moment, he stands up, reads it, shuts it, and goes, this is who I am. I am this. I am, I am the I am. Oh, I love that. Okay, turn with me really quick to Daniel 3. We're going to give an example of the bondages being consumed. Daniel 3, 19 through 30. We know this story well. But there's one area I want to sit on, but 19 through 30. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expressions were altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the, fire, the furnace seven times more than it usually was heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of the blazing fire. <clears throat> Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, and their caps, and their clothes, and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. This reason, because the king's command was, was urgent, and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <clears throat> but these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the fire, furnace of blazing fire and stood tied up. Please circle tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men that we cast bound, circle bound, into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like the Son of God. When Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire, he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. <laughs> You servants of the Most High God, oh, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire, and what? The satraps, the, pre the pre prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that, that the fire had no effect on their bodies, <laughs> nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were the trousers damaged, nor was the smell of fire even on them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, was sent, who, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants and put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their bodies so that not, not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, who, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the Lord of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses reduced with rubbish heap insomuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. <sighs> Do you hear that? Underline that. There is no other God to be able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. <sighs> All right. Our consuming fire of God consumes our bondage. Consumes our bondage. Fire has the ability to destroy or to develop depending on what is being burned. Destroy or to develop. You know, during this whole, when they were in there, you guys know this, ropes or, or whatever bound them at that time was burned off. It was gone. It was leaved into ashes and unno even unnoticeable. They didn't even smell like smoke. And then what, did it ha what happened? What did Nebuchadnezzar say about God? What did he say? This is the one true God, right? This is the one. This is the most high. And you know, I'm telling you, ladies, listen to me. In the midst of your fire, your fire is not just about you. It's not just about you. When you are going through Hades and you are burned and you're struggling and you're in the midst of that fire, how you handle, how you walk out, how you stay steadfast in your faith, Reveals to everyone around you whom you serve. It destroys you. You serve self. It destroys your bondage. You serve your God. Do you understand what I'm saying? And everyone will worship the Lord through that. See, when we see that it depends on what is being burned, we have the ropes here. But what's also really cool, which I mentioned on Friday night, it, is metals. And with metals... They're being purified. They're being molded to make be made stronger and more beautiful. First Peter, write this down. First Peter six through seven. First Peter six through seven says this: In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, 
You have been distressed by various trials. Why? Verse 7 says why? So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which perishes through tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you guys get this picture of this beautiful forming of gold? When we stand before the Lord, it gives him praise and honor and glory. At the ones he's molding and making into the image that he desires. Your steadfast faith is more precious than gold. He longs to refine you. You know, I was thinking about a couple years ago we did... Um, a vessel for honor was our theme for our women's conference. And we went through the tabernacle and how all the different pieces of the tabernacle pointing to Christ and just looking through all of that. Well, every single one of those were made of a precious, precious metal. They're made of gold. And, and I look at those things and I'm like, how stinking detailed is our God? Right? Where he longs to, and just in First Peter, okay, create, like our faith that he creates in us is more precious than gold. Gold is very, very precious to him. So throughout the temple, he uses this gold, um, and he uses it to really reveal his glory. And knowing that, man, his temple, what, who is the temple now? We, we are, right? So how, how much care did he take care of the holy holies? How much care did he take care of the holy place? How much value did he put on that? A lot, right? He put so much value. So when you look at you as a vessel, ladies, and, and, man, you hear that growing up. You hear, your temple, your temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know, First Corinthians, your temple of the Holy Spirit. But, man, if God thinks so highly, and that's how he took care of his earthly temple, for the physical temple, and then he took the Spirit of God, that Shekinah glory that was in the Holy of Holies, and he placed it in each one of us, how much more should we take care of that temple? How much more should we be a willing vessel for him to use? Right? It's high value. It's high value. Everything within that temple was gold. God's tabernacle, us, the Holy Spirit, we need to outfit ourselves with the highest quality materials. And I mean inside, not just outside. Okay? Not outside. Highest quality materials. So, God is preparing this spiritual temple. Okay? This gold-making process. I went through this website, the Royal Vision, to go through kind of the process of gold making because it's so beautiful. Of course, every time that God, he uses a picture or a principle, you get dive into that. You ever with me? You dive into a principle he gives and it's like, <gasps> you know, it's so cool. The word of God is so cool. There's so many dimensions to it and it's, it's just awesome. So we're going to look at this gold, this gold making process. In precious metal operations, ore is the chief source of gold, okay? Ore must be mined with great effort and expense. Usually the heavy equipment or blasted with explosives, is blasted with explosives from deep within the earth's crust before the purification process can begin. So God chose every single one of us in the raw. So the pictures that she's going to show right now, um, my husband is from Cripple Creek, Colorado, which is really close to where I was raised. And yeah, and this is actual pictures of now is the, the biggest gold mine in the United States, the continental United States. The biggest one is in, in Alaska, but this is the biggest one um, in the continental United States. And right now, it's, it's still very active. This is the hometown that he grew up in, um, 30 minutes from the hometown I grew up in. And um, so this is the gold mine there. Go ahead and go to the next one. Just giving you a picture of how vast and how massive it is. Um, yeah, and he knows all these stats of how much gold they've gotten out of it. And it's just continual, continual. His parents own a railroad that's a tourist train that's right there. And you can kind of see and go through all that and, and see the gold mining stuff. But I was like, these are stinking awesome pictures. Huh? Cripple Creek, Colorado. It's like about 30 miles west of Colorado Springs. Or 40 miles west of Colorado Springs. It's, it's by Pikes Peak. So just giving you visuals. I'm not a visual person. You know anything about it. Like, yeah. See? All right, come on. Not at all. Okay, so God chose each one of us in the raw. So there's these raw, this, the, the rock, if you look at a rock that is ored, um, is mined for gold, it looks like a normal, regular rock. Do you have that one? 
Yeah, just like a normal rock. There's nothing, you can't, and you can see some of the gold in that one, but usually, like we're walking through the, the there's like little pathways and different things you can look at in Cripple Creek. You can see some of the, the, the rock, and it, it's like this. This is how they get this gold out of this. It looks like just a normal, regular rock. There's like veins in it that are purplish color, most of them. And when that ore is, or the rock is melted, you can start to see the gold um, that melts. But each one of us, so God chose each one of us in the raw. So we are unrefined, very rocky, very jagged edged, okay? Um, Jude shows us the process that God goes through in Jude 1. If you want to go there later, we don't have time to go through all that, but write Jude 1. Um, and it's just a part of the process that God goes through in setting us apart, preserving and protecting us, um, and then calling us to become his holy temple. So I encourage you to go look at that. As a master geologist and surveyor, God has spent considerable time studying each of us to measure our potential for yielding righteous characteristics, determining how much gold we may be able to produce. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28 says, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28 says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise, according to worldly standards. Amen? Amen? Not many of you are powerful. Not many of you are noble birth, but... God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what was weak in the world to shame the strong. And God, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring, nothing, bring to nothing things that are. See, that's the whole beauty of sanctification. He takes the things of wisdom and he makes them low, right? He shows us weakness so we know his strength. Despite our flaws, we are now the only ones God has chosen to work with. We talked about this this morning. I was talking to my kids about animals. They're like, oh, I love animals. I love animals. I'm like, yeah, and then you just look at us. We're stupid sheep, yet we're the only ones God chose to use. <laughs> you know? Doesn't make sense. Though we would be considered worthless by many, it is for this very reason that God has chosen us with no flesh and that, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Okay, so we're going to go through these three steps of refining, okay? Three steps of refining that is required. So th- three gold refining steps. Number one is ore state, which we talked about, this ore state. The initial step in the process was to pound, shatter, and crush the ore into fine powder. Anybody can relate to this hunk of rock? Okay, Anybody? You ever feel like you're being, who said, yeah, Heather, stabbed in the heart. Crushed, pound, shattered into fine powder, okay? The elements that made up this ore, dirt, rock, minerals, gold, and what other other metals or unwanted materials remained. They were totally pulverized. God's chosen ore has an excessive amount of undesirable elements. Hate to break it to you. (laughs) Or we call dross. Okay, undesirable elements. The first step in the refining process illustrates the humbling that each of us must go through. And I'm telling you, it's not just one time. It is a constant humbling. Okay? Before God can even begin to work with us, he's first has got to crush us. He's got to humble us. Isaiah 66, 2 says, I'll go slow, 66 too. You can stop me in, if I'm going too fast and go, wait, what scripture? I'm trying to be mindful. Isaiah 66 too. For my hand made all things, thus all things come into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble, a contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. We talked about that, that godly fear, who trembles at my word. Every member of God's church, every member, everyone who calls himself a Christ follower has an initial period of repentance. But the breaking and crushing does not happen all at one time. It does not happen all at one time. I don't, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't handle it. We have to maintain an ongoing attitude and spirit of brokenness before the Lord so that he can pure, the purification process can continue. James 4.10 admonishes us to be to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and then he will lift us up. 1 Peter 5 5 tells us to be clothed with humility because God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. 
Humility is necessary for God to use you, ladies. And the minute that that pride rears its ugly head, you have got to deal a death blow to it. You've got to deal a death blow to it. The very reason that Satan was Satan, because I, I don't want to be God, I want to be like God. I want to be like God. This crushed and broken attitude is exactly what God desired from ancient Israel when he brought them out of bondage of sin that represented Egypt. Israel would not submit to him as an oar, must submit to the refiner. For this stubborn, disbelieving, and faithless hardness, God allowed them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, what honestly should have taken them 11 days. Yeah. Because of this stubborn, disbelieving, and faithless hardness, God allowed them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, which should have taken 11 days. See, you want to fall madly in love with the Lord and you want to serve him with all of your heart? You have to let him refine you. The only one that's getting in the way of your growth is you. And I say that with the most love in the world. The only one that's getting in the way of your growth is you. God has done all the work. All the work. There's nothing else he can do. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, And you shall remember, Deuteronomy 8.2, all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness for these 40 years in order to humble you. You see this? In order to humble you, putting you to the test to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. The situation is no different for us today. He's always wanting and willing to refine us. How does he refine us? The fire you cannot be refined without some heat. <laughs> you cannot be refined without some heat. All right, number, the step two of this gold refining process is washing stage. So in the gold refining process, after the, the, the ore has been mined, it is crushed and pounded into powder. Then it must go through frequent washings and cleansings. During these washings, the unwanted non-metallic elements are, to a large extent, eliminated. Only the metallic elements are left behind. This is continual. So as with the first step, an ongoing washing must occur at, on our converted life. First John 1 John 1.9, you know it. There's a picture of the, the washing of these elements. Oh, sorry. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we can, we know this, confess our sins, God is faithful and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives. Okay, he's saying to love your wives. And then he gives exactly what Jesus does. Just as Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, set her apart, having cleansed her with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present himself to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Christ is the only one qualified to cleanse us from our sins. He is perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice, giving us full access to the Father by ripping that veil at the moment on the cross. Failing to submit and perform this step leaves us, it leaves us as ore, unbroken and unwa unwashed. It brings a halt to God's purification process. We must go to him in repentance and be washed daily. How much time, ladies, are you giving God to wash you daily? I don't mean just read some scriptures or read a chapter. I mean, let that scripture wash you, cleanse you. He said, washing by the water of the word of God. I'm telling you, you cannot see straight if you're not in the word of God. You cannot. You cannot. Just like when you go through your, your discipleship book, when you do one-on-one discipleship, that spiritual breathing, that time in the word, that time with the Lord is vital it's vital if you're not in it guys i challenge you. listen to me you know why this is so powerful because i'm telling you it's the one thing the enemy will do whatever he can to fill your schedule with so much busyness to fill your flesh with so much laziness 
I can confidently tell you that because it is, it is um, living proof. It is something you have to fight for. Because it will be the first thing the enemy will want to take out of your life. If you are not digesting the word of God, I'm telling you right now, you will not be able to stand firm in a trial. You will not be able to do it. I want, to, I want you to go with me really quickly to Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah is probably one of my absolute favorites. Um, my mentor, Cindy, would always say, like, just throughout my whole walk, Lord, so you remind me of Jeremiah so much, I'm like, I can't not talk, I cannot share, I will scream till I die. <laughs> this truth of God's word. But anyways, but Jeremiah, go with me to Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. Very quickly, Jeremiah was complaining to the Lord in this context, and he's like, God, I'm struggling, right? These people are prospering. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, he had an attitude of just complaint. And then uh, verse 5 says, if you, he says, to, the Lord replies to him, if you have run with footmen and, have tired, and then they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in the land of peace, how will you do, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? The Lord's simple, you notice how the Lord always answers with questions. He so often answers with questions. Joshua's complaining to God. I'm suffering. I hate this fire. Why does it feel like everybody else is going through the easier fire than I'm going through? Right? He's complaining. And God tells him, it's going to get worse, Joshua. If you can't stand up, up underneath this tiny little bit of suffering, you will not be able to un uh, really walk through what I have for you in the future. You've got to learn to be steadfast. You've got to learn to cling to, your, to my word because it's gonna get worse. It's only the slightest difficulty you're collapsing under. You need to be able to learn how to run in the midst of the fire. I wanna speak to the young ladies just for a minute. It's just heavy on my heart that especially Grow up and getting in your teens. I'm talking to everybody. <laughs> Trust me, I'm talking to everybody. But especially the young ones. You were not born into a culture um, and a generation that requires resolve. You weren't. You were born into a generation and a culture that requires whatever I feel like. Your culture teaches you to go with your feelings. Your culture teaches you to look at what's on your TV set and that should be what you aspire to. And I'm telling you right now, ladies, if you do not learn to be steadfast, learn how to be resolved on the truth of God's word, our time is gonna be more and more difficult for you to stand. It's gonna be harder and harder for you to stand up for your faith. And I wanna challenge you and I want to speak to your heart as much as I can with much love in the world. If you want to be steadfast, if you want to be a woman of God, you have to learn, listen to me, to live in the scriptures. You have to learn to live in the scriptures. You have to learn to fall in love with your God. And I don't care how young you are in this room. Man, if you can get that right now. Live there, dwell there, breathe the scriptures. I know if you talk to any older woman in this room, her biggest regret would have been, I wish I would have dove into this sooner. I wish I would have fallen in love with him sooner. I wish I would have taken this as truth as it is sooner. Because you have a generation and a culture that is dying to know truth. And we're all these old ladies are not going to be here much longer. You are the next generation. You know, cling to the word of God and do not budge. Live in the scripture. If you've gone through any of our studies or, or discipleship, um, we go through the process of, of what that looks like. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through with you just simple, simple. How do I stay in the scripture? How do I live in the scriptures? Um, there's just a process that we've done that is so beautiful. Yeah, get your pens out. Please write this down. <laughs> it saved my life in walking with the Lord. So first thing that you do in the morning, and I'm telling you in the morning, and I fought it too. I know what you're saying. I am the worst morning person in the world. I am. I hate mornings. But I'll tell you what, you give God your first fruits in the mornings. <sighs> 
It's the most powerful thing in the world. Most powerful. So I'm telling you in the morning, you write your yesterday, and you're doing this every day. So I've talked to a lot of you that it's like, man, there's, there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and there's piled and piled and piled. Well, if you deal with this every single day, you deal with that yesterday, and you ask the Lord, God, show me my heart. Show me my heart yesterday. Was there any sin in me? Reveal to me anything that is a stumbling block, anything that's keeping me out of your perfect will. Reveal it. And be bold enough to do something with it. Allow him to reveal that. Go to the Lord in prayer immediately. Confess it, repent it. Okay? This is daily. Some days may be longer than others. But it's daily. Okay? And then the next thing, whatever scripture you're going through. Ladies, you have your root work. Ladies, you have your root work. Your, your root work. <laughs> whatever scripture you're going through. Okay? Go through a little bit at a time. You cannot be washed by the word of God if you are reading a chapter at a time. You cannot. You have got to go through it slowly. And if it's one verse you sit on and you bawl on and you cry on, you snot bubble, stay on that one verse for that day. Let the Lord wash you. Don't just read it. Allow it to penetrate your heart and go, okay, where's the heart questions, right? Where's the heart question? Where am I at in this? Allow God to reveal that. And then you go into your prayer time after that. And then you thank God. What for what he showed you, you confess whatever ex- other sins that he revealed during that time, and you walk that out. I used to do, use acts. It's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and sanctification. Okay? That's just a simple, it's not a formula. It's a simple way that you can get into the word of God. You can be washed by his word and be ready for the day. Some days... It may take you longer than others. Okay? But it doesn't have to. You have 20 minutes. Boom. Lord's like, and you walk out completely brand new, clean woman ready for the day. Okay? Live in the word of God. Live in the word of God. At this point in the purification process, the crushed and cleansed ore is collected and then it must be submitted to the furnace. All right. So step three is the refining fire. Refiner's fire. This is God's consuming fire. The, the dross-filled gold ore melts at the, at the extreme temperature of 1,948 degrees Fahrenheit. If you want to be technical. <laughs> in order to raise the furnace. Anybody feel like they've been in that type of heat? In order to raise the furnace so that the white-hot temperature bellows are used to pump oxygen into the raging fire. Once the ore melts, an amazing thing happens. The impurities of the gold begin to rise to the top. The refiner is then able to skim the impurities off the top of the molten metal. The more this process is repeated. This is actually from Cripple Creek. This is what they do as they continue to uh, going through the, the fire over and over again. The, listen to this. The more the process is repeated. Notice how I said repeated. It repeats. The fire not once, twice, three times. No, it repeats over and over. The more it repeats, the purer the gold is. You hear that? The more you go through the fire and you remain steadfast, the purer the gold is. This process is equated to the fiery trials we face as believers. Though unpleasant, this step is vital and necessary part of our lives. It's vital. First Peter, you can write it down. First Peter 4, 12 through 16. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for the testing, for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. <laughs> do you hear that? So many times you're like, man, why is this happening? It feels like every time I get close to the Lord, the harder it gets. That's a reason for that. You're on the right track. You're on the right track. Don't be surprised when these, these strange things are happening to you. But to, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Why? So that the revelation of his glory may also, we may also rejoice and be overjoyed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this manner. Verse 19 says, Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Doing what is right. Isaiah 125 says, I will also turn my hand against you. This is God speaking. I will smelt away your dross as with lye and with, I'll remove all of your alloy or your impurities. Isn't that cool how God gives so many beautiful principles and pictures for his word? It's only after we have been fired in the furnace that the refiner can begin to skim the surface of all the impurities, all the yuck, all the insecurities, all the fears. You know, we're in the fire, it reveals a lot of fear, right? We're in the fire, it reveals the most, whew, where our insecurities lie. And he very gently takes that top surface and he cleans it. He removes it. In order to bear such trials, we must keep the refiner's perspective. This will allow us to face the difficulties with joy and gladness. And then produce the very patience that God says is more precious than gold itself. We will face many trials in our life. Each time, we must remember that no matter how difficult or how painful it becomes, we have the refiner's full assurance. He is sovereign. And by his very nature, we'll use every fire we go through for his glory and our good. He will, he will use this process to produce something beautiful. This scripture I'm going to read for you is Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. This was a scripture as I walked through my testimony and as I started sharing my testimony, um, my family, my, my mom specifically, I had had a conversation with her and she was very frustrated. I had actually contacted someone that I went to high school with and, and actually she contacted me and I got to share the gospel with her and I, I was sharing my testimony and I, I told my mom, I was like, oh, it's so cool, I got to share my testimony. And she's like, you did what? How did you share that? You know, you know. She was, it, it was a reflection of her at that moment, that's sort of the season that she was at and she was struggling with that. And so I wrote her a letter and in this letter, I just poured out my heart and I told her mom, I said, mom, the choices I made were not your fault. The choices that I, the things that I did had nothing to do with you. You raised me in a Christian home, okay? There were situations in our home that, yes, I had to walk through and I had to deal with, but that was not on you. It is not your fault. Honestly, I'm thankful that I went through what I went through because I would not know my God like I know my God if I didn't. And I shared with her this verse. I said, this is my verse. This is, this is what God did. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Guess what? This is the very scripture that Jesus quoted when he was in the temple in the synagogue that I read to you in the beginning. This is where it's from. This is the first part of it. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is the part that I cling to, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to the day that he comes to comfort, listen, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve, to bestow on them, he, which, which he has done for me, just bestow on me a crown of beauty instead of ashes. He's put the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So that I, I, your daughter, one that God has given you to raise, I, I can be called oaks of righteousness for the display of his splendor. What's happened to me is for him. It's for his splendor and for his glory. And I want you to rejoice with me in that. Rejoice in, with me that he has taken this crazy, horrible, hot mess out of the miry clay and he has set me on a rock for the display of his splendor. There's no shame. There's no guilt. It's beauty because he's taken beauty from ashes. And he's done the same in your story as well. He's done the same in your story as well. So the final product of this, this, this process of gold making is reflection and restoration. 
So the miner, who knows, who only knows when the gold is fully purified and rid of imperfections, he's the only one who's going to know this. And he can look, how he knows this is when he looks over the, the pot that we just had in the second. He looks over the pot of this hot, melted gold, all the imperfections removed, all of the stuff, the gross and yuck, is removed. He looks over it, and he can see his reflection. You see, the more we go through the fire and the more impurities that are removed, the more we're going to look like Christ. And none of us, ladies, until we take our last breath, until we stand before our Savior, are going to be completely clean of all those impurities. We're not. But man, we can enjoy the sanctification process until we do. It's exactly what God is doing in your life and in my life. In every fiery trial, the heat is turned up. It is always ultimately going to be for his glory. We, taught, we quoted this all weekend long, but I love these together because people just focus on 28 so much too. Romans 8, 28 through 30 says, And we know that God causes all things, not just some things, not just some fires, but all of them to work together for the good of those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Do you see that? Conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus wants to see himself in you. When he looks at you, as you reflect him and his character, he wants to see himself in you. Pure and blameless. And you know what, what's so beautiful about his, just the redemption gospel in itself. He's given us every single thing we need to allow him to do that. We have the Holy Spirit of God. We have the trials he puts us under. We have the truth of his word. We have prayer. We have an intimate relationship with him. Everything we need. He wants your faith, ladies, to be pure as gold. He wants it to be steadfast and immovable in his hands to create in you a pure heart, one that can be useful for the Father's purpose. But we can't do it on our own. He needs to do it through us. He tests our faith and belief using trials. Our actions show him whether we will live our lives in true submission to his laws, statutes, and judgments. And if we'll remain faithful regardless of our physical circumstances. You know, as I was going through this, I almost passed out when you opened to Job. I was like, no, oh my gosh, I'm going to be talking to Job. Um, as I was closing and I was putting just the stuff together, Job has been, in times of seasons of my life, a, an anchor. You know, that book of Job has really, because, you know, things where you're like, man, I don't think I can breathe. I'm hurting so bad. And you look at Job like, okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> you know, you walk through this whole process and the difficulties. Job suffered so many fires. So many fires, right? More probably than we will ever in our lifetime. I just wrote down a few. Okay, he suffered. Number one, he suffered a whew, massive financial disasters. Loss of herds and flocks and wealth, okay? All of his wealth gone. He suffered the death of his 10 children. 10 children. He suffered an extremely painful physical disease and sores. He suffered the pain and distress of a wife who could not understand him and his faith and could neither sympathize nor empathize with him. All she offered was despairing, godless advice to curse God and die. He suffered misunderstanding and rejection from everyone he knew. He suffered a deep sense of being isolated, alone in his sufferings, alone in his pain, in his grief. There was no one who understood, no one who had compassion. He was totally alone. At least that's what he felt like. I love the prayers of Job as he cries out and he's honest and real with the Lord. And I love the Lord's response. Was it you, Job? Was it you? I have a plan and a purpose. It's beautiful. But I want to quote Job 23.10. Because so often we can struggle with this. This is Job, and he's at his deepest, darkest moments, and he says, Behold, I go before, but he is not there, and backward, but I can't perceive him. Then he acts on the left, and I cannot see him. He turns to the right, and I cannot see him. Anybody been there? Listen to me. This is so powerful. But he knows, see that but? He knows the way I take. 
And when he has put me to the test, I will come out as pure gold. He knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I will come out as pure gold. Do you see that? We can easily go, man, Jessica, you don't understand my fire. I, I don't think you've suffered any of that stuff, have you? Maybe some, one, but all of them? No, right? Look at what Jesus went through. Just in the emotional part, we were, we're wrecked at rejection. We're wrecked at backstabbing, right? No, he says, I can't see him. We may be thinking that throughout this weekend, your thoughts, man, I, I, I turn to the right, I turn to the left, I can't, I can't feel him, I can't see him, I can't perceive him. I, can't, I cannot see him. And I want to tell you, it's okay. He sees you. He sees you. And you don't always have to see him. But what you do have to do, cling to the word of God with every fiber of your being because this is the only truth you can stand on. Because there will be times where you cannot see, you cannot feel, you cannot know. But you have to cling. You have to get on your knees like James. Put some calluses on those knees. Pray. Be in his word. Surround yourself with like-minded believers. And do not stop sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we be like Job. No matter what fire we go through, no matter what loss, no matter what trial, no matter what pain, may we let these fires expose a faith that is unwavering, one that will not budge one that will not look to the right or to the left, but will stay constant and consistent no matter what we see, what we think, what we feel. He never changes. Let him have his way. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and if Becky and Leslie, you guys will come up, um, we're going to have communion as well. But um, as we do that and as we, we, we worship and we pray, Lord, I want the Lord to really be able to minister to your heart before you take communion. This is not something we do lightly. When you take part in the remembrance of what he's done for us, when you take part in saying, I take this as a remembrance, like you have given me life, you have given your sacrifice, your, your body, you, you've taken on the wrath of my sin, and I take this in remembrance of you, and I take it through worship. You know, when you communion, it's worship. It's a time of worshiping the Lord. We serve a consistent God, ladies. We serve a consistent God. And I'll tell you right now, if there's anybody in this room that does not know that she knows, that she knows, that she knows that Jesus Christ is her Lord and Savior and she will follow him all the days of her life, I want that her, that she, that someone to come to me and to pray before you even take communion. Do not touch those elements until you receive him as your Lord and Savior. But ladies, before you do, as you are a Christ follower, make a resolve before you take that communion. Make a resolve. Say, Lord, I will, no matter what fire, I will stay steadfast and true. I will cling. I will live in your word. I will surround myself with godly women that will point me in the right direction. Tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Right? Make a resolve. Offer yourself first as a living sacrifice before you take the remembrance of his. Heavenly Father, God, we praise you for this whole weekend. God, thank you. Thank you as you minister to the hearts of the women in this room. Thank you for offering your son to die a death we could never die, pay a price we could never pay, to be our great switcheroo, to take our place, to take, carry on our sin, to be the consuming fire of judgment for us. Lord, I pray right now that you just reveal to our hearts the fullness of what you've done for us. And in response to that, we just want to give you glory and praise with awe and reverence and serve you all the days of our lives. Lord, I pray for every woman's faith in this room. Continue to strengthen it. Continue, yes, continue with the fires, Lord, so that our faith may be steadfast and immovable. Lord, I pray, God, you overwhelm us with your spirit before we even take these elements, before we even say, 
thank you. May we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you. One that is unwavering. One that will say, you know what, no matter what, I'm going to remove everything that hinders my relationship with you. God, thank you for what you've done. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for this weekend, Lord. Thank you for meeting us where we're at and loving us too much to keep us there. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.